Good afternoon. I'm uh, A.B. Call the House. I have the honor of being counsel to the President of the United States. Uh, let me introduce briefly uh, to try to pick up some time the members of our panel. To my uh, far right is the Honorable Charles Bennett, who's a member of Congress from Florida. He's in his 20th term, I am advised. He's been a longtime senior member of the House Armed Services Committee and chairman of its Sea Power Subcommittee. Then Professor William Van Alstyne, he's Perkins Professor at Duke University uh, School of Law, a, a well-known uh, constitutional uh, scholar and has written uh, more than one law review on, uh, on this topic, uh, one, more than one law review article. Uh, to my uh, far left is uh, Professor Jeffrey Miller of the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, Professor Miller is a uh, clerk in the D.C. Circuit for Judge McGowan and on the Supreme Court for Justice White. And he was in private practice here in Washington before uh, joining the Chicago faculty. And then uh, my good friend uh, Brad Reynolds, who's Assistant Attorney General of the United States in the Civil Rights Divi Division since 1981 and is a uh, counselor to the Attorney General. Uh, let me uh, briefly go over the ground rules, if I may. Uh, each panelist will uh, make a presentation, we hope, for about 10 minutes. Uh, I am uh, instructed to intervene uh, in a nice way after 15 minutes. Uh, then there will be a time for a brief rebuttal. Uh, then, time permitting, we will go to a question and answer uh, period. Uh, and uh, I reserve the right to ask the first question, uh, uh, if I might. Our panel, as Dr. Brzezinski uh, indicated today, will be discussing the President's powers as Commander-in-Chief under Article II of the Constitution versus uh, Congress's war power and appropriations power under Article I. It's a topic of great moment to everybody. I think it's particularly of great moment to me since the uh, stark incident uh, on May 20th, uh, I as counsel of the President have convened what we call our War Powers Committee of Senior Administration Lawyers uh, countless times. That includes some of the speakers you'll be hearing uh, later uh, on later panels, Abe Sofair, the legal advisor at the State Department, and Chuck Cooper, the Assistant Attorney General of the Office of Legal Counsel. And we are grappling with the, the thorny constitutional uh, and political issues under the War Powers Resolution. At the same time, uh, over 110 members of Congress, I, not including, I, I believe, Congressman Bennett, have sued the President, uh, asserting that he has failed to comply with the uh, War Powers Resolution. Uh, that case is currently being litigated primarily on standing and justiciability grounds in the uh, uh, Federal District Court here in uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, the uh, Senate, uh, probably more so than the House, but, uh, but Congress has, uh, is grappling with the war powers issue in the context of the Persian Gulf, and uh, uh, Senator Byrd, Senator Weicker, Senator Warner, Congressman Solars have all made uh, proposals to, to resolve this, uh, this crisis. Uh, I think, uh, however, I, I should emphasize that the, the problem, the issue, the debate is more fundamental than our 15 years experience with the War Powers Act, the War Powers Resolution. It's a debate that has ebbed and flowed uh, for over 200 years since the Constitutional Convention. Uh, if I might, uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize uh, in brief form the uh, what hopefully are all of the relevant constitutional uh, provisions. Uh, with respect to Congress under Article I, Section 1 vests the legislative power granted in the Constitution in Congress. Section 8 states that Congress shall have the power to declare war, the power to raise and support armies, the power to provide, to provide and maintain a navy, the power to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. Section 9 of Article 1 articulates Congress's appropriations power. It provides that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. With respect to the President, his Article 2 powers include the fundamental vesting 
in Article One of Article Two, in Section One of Article Two of the Executive Power in the President of the United States. Section Two provides that the President shall be Commander in Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states. Finally, Section Four of Article Four states that the United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government and that the United States shall protect each state against invasion. Now let's turn to our panelists. First, uh, the Honorable William Bradford Reynolds. If you want, yeah, we'll uh, it's your preference, Brand. Thank you, A.V. Distinguished uh, panel members, it certainly uh, is a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to participate on, on this panel and to discuss the topic today. I will, uh, I will try to provide some, what of a over, overview or background uh, view of what I think uh, is the probably crucial issue that, uh, that undergirds this whole discussion, that is a relationship of Congress and the executive and their respective approaches in these areas. Uh, as a backdrop to a more direct discussion. And I do want to extend my thanks and congratulations to the Federalist Society at the outset for once again taking up an extremely important and timely topic. The year of 1987 is not yet at an, e at an end, but as its sun sets, it can be now regarded as a year almost unprecedented in its degree of constitutional controversy. The Iran-Contra investigation, the dispute over the interpretation of the ABM treaty, the debate over the use of U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf, the confirmation fight over Judge Bork, these and other dramatic developments of recent months have dominated the spotlight. Taken together, they provide a vivid reminder that 200 years after our great charter of the Constitution was signed and submitted to the federal states for ratification, the division of powers among the branches of the national government in many respects bears little resemblance to that which the framers intended. In reflecting on how much one would have missed if he had slept through 1987, a notion that in retrospect I think has considerable appeal, <laughs> I was reminded of the story about a fellow who dozed off in 1959 and awoke not a year later but 10 years later in 1969. And his first question was, how is President Eisenhower? Someone at his bedside told him President Eisenhower had just recently died, and the sleeper gasped, good heavens, you mean Nixon is president? <laughs> well, it's true that the more things change, the more, in some ways, they seem to remain the same. If Madison were awakened today from his nearly two centuries of rest, he no doubt would be taken aback by the awesome growth and power of the judiciary, supposedly the least dangerous branch. But in assessing the legislative branch's persist persistent encroachment upon the powers and prerogatives of the executive, he would surely be the first to say, I told you so. Just as in our time, it is fashionable in some quarters to refer to the imperial presidency while largely ignoring the transgressions of the often far more imperious Congress, so too was the popular sentiment at the founding uh, vigorously inclined against a king-like president with far less concern being directed uh, toward the uh, dangers that were posed by an overweening legislature. For Madison, however, that worry was misplaced. It was Congress that he viewed as the most dangerous branch. And his warnings ring almost prophetic when one examines them in light of the legislative branch's contemporary arrogation of power in foreign affairs, judicial selection, and indeed nearly every quarter of governmental activity. Commenting upon the experiences of the fledgling American state governments, Madison wrote in Federalist Number 48 that the legislative department is everywhere extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its impetuous vortex. He viewed the legislative branch as inherently more threatening because of the difficulty of defining clearly the limits on its power. He thus concluded, it is against the enterprising ambition of this department that the people ought to indulge all their jealousy and exhaust all their precautions. The experience of 200 years gives us the hindsight now to appreciate how wonderful prescient this warning was. 
particularly more recently, that the legislature has earned the distinction of the most dangerous branch may well surprise some in this group, which has devoted much of its energy, and admirably so, to exposing and criticizing the arrogation of policymaking power unto the judicial branch. But I am not sure on reflection that the surprise is warranted. As I have stated on other occasions, self-aggrandizement is only partially responsible for the growth we have seen over the years in judicial power. To be sure, the propensity of many judges toward activism is a source of much mischief. But the elected branches, especially the Congress, have encouraged this usurpation of judicial power by carelessly, more often intentionally, allowing important issues to go unaddressed in the legislative and administrative processes, thus leaving to the courts the task of filling the vacuum. With all due respect to my fellow panel member, at whom the following observations are not directed, Members of Congress, by and large, appear to have become bored and disinterested with the often tedious task of legislating. And in far too many cases, have become enamored with posturing as Secretary of State or Defense, as the Attorney General, and even as a Supreme Court Justice. What is particularly unsettling is that some seem to take themselves seriously. Moreover, many members find their longevity in office aided considerably by ducking the tough and controversial decisions that would be required in any conscientious performance of legislative responsibility, striking instead a comfortable compromise that is calculated neither to offend nor satisfy anyone. The courts are thus invited, indeed expected, to sort out the irreconcilable differences as the judges see fit. In this context, the expansion of judicial power should not be seen solely in terms of a power grab by judges, but equally, as a redistribution of powers impelled by Congress, not as an isolated development, but as part of a pattern that has served to seriously erode the allocation of powers among the branches and the checks and balances that attend that allocation. For at the same time that Congress has become listless when it comes to legislating, it has become far too infatuated with oversight, having in large measure relieved itself of the burden of painstakingly writing the people's wishes into law the legislative branch has turned to second-guessing virtually every decision of the executive branch, and even in some instances arguing that the executive decision is really Congress's to make. Thus, everything from military deployments, intelligence gathering activities, and international negotiations, to law enforcement, judicial selection, and administration of domestic programs, has come under hyper-intensive congressional scrutiny. More often than not these days, this legislative oversight activity has little or no nexus to the legitimate performance by Congress of its constitutionally mandated legislative function or to its more modest advise and consent function. This preoccupation with oversight has the perverse consequence of affording exposure without accountability, a commodity seemingly in great demand in this era of slick media images and special interest pressures. Equally disquieting, it provides for many an aura of heightened congressional activity when there is really nothing very constructive going on. Increasingly, the task of running the House and Senate has been handed off to youthful and inexperienced staff members who comprise the fastest growing bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. The effect of this development on separation of powers and on the ability of the executive branch to carry out its constitutional functions has, of course, been dramatic. The spate of congressional inquisitions in recent years has too often run roughshod over executive privilege, forcing such comprehensive and minuscule disclosures of every scrap of paper generated, no matter how irrelevant, that internal discussions and deliberations vital for effective administration suffer mightily. This phenomenon is by no means limited to, foreign policy, to the foreign policy context. Although there, the problem is magnified several fold by the concern that internal conversations and memoranda may be turned to the advantage not only by domestic political opponents, but by foreign adversaries as well. The demonstrated inability of congressional committees to preserve the confidentiality of such communications and to keep secrets generally compounds the problem immeasurably. More directly in the field of foreign relations, we have seen since the Vietnam experience an increasingly assertive Congress, intruding broadly into the execution of American foreign policy, purporting to interpret and even redefine treaties, and through the Ethics in Government Act, tending toward criminalization of interbranch disputes. Congress, of course, 
does have a legitimate and important role to play in foreign affairs through the proper use of the appropriation power, through its determination whether to declare war, and its advice and consent to treaties, among other powers. But the recent story is less one of congenial constitutional power sharing than of determined encroachment upon the powers of the executive in the international field, encroachment that has taken its toll on American efficacy and prestige abroad and the bipartisan spirit that long attended foreign policy matters at home. The framers understood the transcendent importance of national unity in foreign relations, hence Madison's declaration, if we are to be one nation in any respect, it clearly ought to be in respect to other nations. The need for unity in such matters, as well as the capacity for swift and decisive action, counsel not only a strong national government, but the vesting of executive authority in a single leader. Referring to the President's role in the conduct of negotiations with foreign powers, John Jay wrote, they who have turned their attention to the affairs of men must have perceived that there are tides in them, tides very irregular in their duration, strength, and direction. To discern and profit by these tides in the national affairs is the business of those who preside over them. And there frequently are occasions when days, nay, even hours, are precious. The loss of a battle, the death of a prince, the removal of a minister, or other circumstances may turn the most favorable tide into a course opposite to our wishes. As in the field, so in the cabinet. There are moments to be seized as they pass, and they who preside in either should be left in capacity, should be left in capacity to improve them. In defending the validity of President Washington's neutrality proclamation of 1793, Hamilton argued that full responsibility for direction of foreign policy was within the general grant of executive power to the President under Article II of the Constitution. Six years later, then Congressman John Marshall echoed the argument when he stated, the President is the sole organ of the nation in its, ex in its external relations and its sole representation with foreign nations. In the 1936 Supreme Court decision in United States versus Curtis Wright Export Corporation, Justice Sutherland's opinion for the majority referred to the very delicate, plenary, and exclusive power of the president as the sole organ of the federal government in the field of inter international relations. While the breadth of the general executive power over foreign relations is properly subject to continuing debate, the grant of authority to the president as commander in chief and the distinction made by the framers in substituting the declare war for make war phrase and the delineation of congressional powers serve to fortify the broader interpretation of the scope of, the pres of presidential authority. And this has been the view throughout our history, at least until the last two decades. As of 1970, presidents had dispatched troops or sent significant arms abroad 199 times. But in only five of those instances did Congress declare war, and in only 62 of them was there any congressional consent given by specific appropriation, resolution, or treaty, but well over 4,000 executive agreements with foreign governments. As Congress has moved of late to assert authority in these areas, it has done so circuitously and in ways that are constitutionally suspect. For example, rather than simply exercising its power to cut off funding for military operations it does not support, thereby joining the issue in circumstances affording accountability, Congress has taken refuge in the War Powers resolution, resolution, one highly questionable feature of which is to require automatic termination of any use of American armed forces upon congressional stalemate made exceeding two months duration. In the nightmarish case of the Bolin Amendment, Congress addressed the critical issue of U.S. aid to Nicaraguan freedom fighters in an ambiguous amendment to a massive continuing resolution, then responded to the inevitable questions of interpretation by holding high-profile public, public hearings that more meaningfully illuminated our adversaries than ourselves. It is, as the old saying goes, no way to run a railroad. The proper resolution of the seemingly conflicting allocation of war and foreign policy-related powers between the executive and legislative branches has been, and is sure to remain, a matter of hot debate as administrations and Congresses come and go. But congressional attempts to reallocate those powers by statute, as through the War Powers Resolution, or by inquisition, as seen, as seen dramatically in the Iran-Contra probe, hardly represent a positive development. As Madison observed, so we see again today, 
that the tendency of Republican governments is to, a, is to aggrandizement of the legislative branch. This bicentennial year of the Constitution and the tumultuous events that have attended it should alert us anew to this danger and rekindle our determination to preserve the delicate balance of powers devised by the framers to guard against our liberties. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Professor Van Alstyne. I will be directing my remarks more explicitly to the War Powers Act and the uh, merely tedious question of its technical constitutionality, certainly not its political wisdom. So far as my private views are concerned, they are that uh, Congress should be asked by the President now promptly to authorize him to extend the time during which the American armed forces may be maintained in the Gulf of Persia, so to secure the free navigation of that waterway to all peaceful commerce. And I should hope very much that if the President were to make that request in an appropriate way, a responsible Congress should indubitably approve such a measure. It is my professional view, on the other hand, that absent such an authorization by Congress for the maintenance of the American armed forces in the Persian Gulf, once 60 days have elapsed, the President will be without any continuing authority as Commander-in-Chief of those armed forces to maintain those forces there, and indeed will be in violation of a valid act of Congress. If he does not, in the absence of breaking that request and Congress approving the extension, at once terminate their involvement in the Persian Gulf. A termination, as I've said to you, I would personally deeply regret, but which I oblige to be a step he must take under a perfectly valid act of Congress. Now, I put the gruff conclusion first. I'm confined now to about nine minutes on a subject that has been written about in volumes, wonderfully controversial among scholars and, and uh, politicians alike. I give up the hope of convincing you. I have taken the usual teacher's sorry recourse even to provide a handout, an inadequate number of copies of which have been distributed. To the extent, then, that my remarks fail to be lucid and convincing in this short compass of time, I would fall back on that. I want first to fall back on it in any case because I want to reemphasize some clauses in the Constitution very briefly to recenter where I think the only sensible constitutional issue lies, which is not, incidentally, over the clause empowering Congress to declare war. I do not regard that clause as involved. It is not the source of the War Powers Act. It is not immediately in controversy in anything at issue between Congress and the President. Neither is the issue as to who is the country's first minister in foreign affairs. I do not doubt that the President is the nation's first minister in foreign affairs. The question, rather, is simply, who determines the extent to which the armed forces of the United States shall or shall not be used as an instrument of foreign policy? Or indeed, in a more blunt manner, who, as between Congress and the President, shall decide what are the lawful uses to be made of the armed forces of the United States? That is not the conventional way the question has usually been put. I suggest to you it is the proper question. The power in this country is vested solely in Congress whether we shall have armies and navies at all. It is quite explicit. There is a separate clause that provides that Congress shall have power to provide for the, quote, government and regulation of the army and navy. A third and very cogent clause, thus far omitted to your attention, is that which also says Congress shall have all powers necessary and proper to make laws, I'm sorry, power to make all laws necessary and proper, not merely to carry into execution its own enumerated powers, but all other powers vested in the government of the United States or any officer or department thereof. You have not normally heard the necessary and proper clause quoted in its full expanse. I would uh, invite you to do so. In short, that necessary and proper clause contemplates in Congress a power to adopt such legislation otherwise when it is capacity to propose to the extent that it feels it appropriate to use those powers in aid of the responsibilities 
or powers of the other departments of government, the president and the courts, not merely to spend money, but to raise and support armies. I start again. Would it be unconstitutional if Congress provided no army and navy at all? It would not. Indeed, not the least discussed subject in the course of the Constitutional Convention, which this, the Federalist Society, most of all, should recall, was whether it would be wise to confide to Congress even the power to levy armies during peacetime at all, or whether it would be niftier to confine them to raising armies only in circumstances of outstanding war. The lack of realism about the latter proposition, though it enjoyed very much support among anti-federalists, merely moved the Constitutional Convention to confide in Congress an authority to establish armies and navies, that is to say national armed forces, even in peacetime, and then to provide for their appropriate use. Suppose then in the middle of the 19th century, a period of mythical isolation, Congress were to provide for an army and navy, but explicitly by law, either with the president's signature or over his veto by two-thirds of both houses, provide that in no in the event shall the armed forces of the United States be deployed outside the Western Hemisphere. Some might, in my mythical society, regret that as a matter of policy. No scholar, so far as I'm aware, would deny the constitutional power in Congress so to confine the use of armed forces in that respect. Indeed, in that respect, the restriction is not much different in character than some restrictions already on the uses of our armed forces. You may be aware, for instance, that even in times of urban riot or domestic violence, it is an odd thing that we do not usually use the army. You may know, rather, we, we nationalize the militia, we nationalize the state guard. Why is that? It is primarily because there are acts of Congress forbidding the use of the standing army against the civilian population, except under the most extraordinary circumstances. The president, then, is indeed commander in chief. That is to say, he is the civilian accountable to obey the act of Congress exactly as commander in chief and not presume to turn the standing army loose upon the civilian population when Congress has not authorized it, no matter how riotous the circumstances may be, and presidents have from time out of mind abided by that admonition. There are very few extraordinary exceptions, each authorized by Congress. Bear with me. Suppose then Congress, by positive enactment, were unwisely to adopt the statute, emphatically providing nonetheless that no armed forces of the United States shall be deployed in any circumstances to the Persian Gulf. Suppose again the president vetoes it, inveighs against it. It is nonetheless overridden by two-thirds majorities in both houses. May the commander in chief nonetheless deploy the armed services to the Persian Gulf? Or is it not clear, rather, as commander in chief, he is accountable precisely to the act of Congress constraining the use of the armed force, which it is the option of Congress to provide on such terms of national safety as it deems appropriate. The Congress may not be so foolish as merely to set those kinds of geographic limitations. They are sufficiently problematic. Circumstances are sufficiently volatile that an area restriction of that type does obviously not commend itself in modern life. It thus does not lay down that kind of restriction. It lays down a different one. The next kind it might lay down is simply one that says, the president shall not deploy armed forces in the Persian Gulf in a situation of existing hostilities or where hostilities are obviously eminent from all the circumstances. Mike Law clear, may not deploy. We're not facing ambiguous problems about troops that may be in place, just may not deploy. I run through the same scenario. The source of power is the power of the Congress to raise and support, maintain and provide for, and provide for the government and regulation of armies and navies and the power to furnish to the president such armed forces as is in the opinion of Congress necessary and proper to aid the president to carry into execution his executive responsibilities. The judgment is its own. We are now on the threshold of the War Powers Act. The War Powers Act is not even that degree of restriction. Read even with reasonable and minimum care, it will allow even the deployment of armed forces in an environment of eminent hostilities. 
but sets an automatic sunset and says they shall be withdrawn after a period of 60 days of their original deployment, unless within that time, Congress affirmatively approves an extension. Logically, the law stands on the same ground. This aspect of the statute, moreover, involves no veto. It is an automatic sunset provision. It terminates as it terminates according to the calendar. As the sun set, if the president does not withdraw the troops, he is literally without authority in presuming to maintain them. I do not suggest that the question is necessarily justiciable in court. It is very difficult to find the courts engaged. It is very possible that the single recourse may be the very unpleasant one of initiating impeachment inquiries through the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives. That, in my opinion, is a dismal, unthinkable, profoundly unsatisfactory political solution. My own feeling is that despite the President's reserve, which he may articulate, about the wisdom or and the constitutionality of the War Powers Act, Incidentally, some other features of it, which I have not now presumed in 10 minutes to address, do raise constitutional questions, but not those to which I have directed my attention. The appropriate thing to do is to try to work with this act, even as we might have tried to work better with Graham Rudman in a different area of executive congressional tension. Apply it in good faith with such optimism as I would want to share with this, the Federalist Society that a Congress whose attention is riveted to the importance of maintaining armed forces under these highly appropriate circumstances certainly should not fail to provide the appropriate extension of authority to maintain those forces under current circumstances. Thank you very much. Congressman Bennett. It's an exciting thing to be an American. We're a part of a, an American revolution still taking place. We must watch what our ancestors did, think about what they constructed, and try to preserve that. This is not a contest between the executive branch, the legislative judicial branch. Think back when the Constitution was written <clears throat> when the Declaration was signed. What did, in fact, Thomas Jefferson mean when he said, all men are created equal? What he meant was that there's no sovereign, no person who is a sovereign of our new society being created. There's no right of a person just because he's born to ancestry which were, quote, noble, unquote. It gave them right to direct the destiny of this new nation that was going to be built. Because our new nation that was going to be built was one where the people were sovereign. And James Madison said, the people were in fact the fountain of all power in our country. We the people of the United States do ordain and establish these things under the Constitution. Chief Justice Jay said, we see the people acting as sovereign for the whole country. Indeed, we had a real revolution. It was not just a revolution of firing arms, but a revolution of spirit in which people were going to control their destiny, in which the Constitution provided that the powers be very limited to government. It was a gift to the nation that the people made, not a gift from the nation, uh, vice versa. Not at all. It was the people decided that certain powers would be given to certain branches of the government. All else would be restricted, not given, withheld by the people themselves. Tenth Amendment of the Constitution underlines that. So what I'm saying to you here today, this is not a conflict between the executive and the legislative branch. This is a question of whether or not you want to do what our forefathers said when they wrote in the Constitution, it would be Congress which would control whether we go to war. And why did they say that? Because most of them are soldiers. I'm an erstwhile soldier myself from World War II. There are not many erstwhile soldiers who favor readily going into war on the edges of war. 
It was my resolution which provided for the Arms Control Agency. I was the author of that legislation. It was my legislation which said don't flag the ships in, in the Persian Gulf. I don't want to go unnecessarily to war. I've seen people die in my arms. I've been with people in combat. I've been in combat myself for years in World War II. I don't want to see that repeated. I don't want unnecessary war. It's not a question of making a, a grand person out of the president. We're not that kind of a country. Sometimes when I read and hear people uh, make statements about the presidency, they seem to have sort of a, a feeling that they're going to put religion back into it. He's a head of the church, head of the, head of the people, head of the government. He's sort of like we'd like to be. That's exactly the opposite of what our country was founded to do. So I think that we ought to look again at what uh, uh, Madison said in another statement he made. He said, uh, the Constitution, this is James Madison, the Constitution supposes that the history of government demonstrate that the executive is the branch of power most interested in wars and most prone to it. It has accordingly with studied care vested this question in the legislature. Why? The legislature has to get elected every two years. It has to respond to the people. If they don't like it, they turn it out. And you get what the people actually want. Now that's what our forefathers thought to today worry about the language in the Constitution in a way that makes you feel like, well, maybe the, the president ought to do all these sort of things because he's our great uh, national leader and all that sort of thing, is to forget what our ancestors thought. And that was that we wanted to see to it the power remained in the people. We didn't go into unnecessary wars and we protected ourselves against that sort of situation. Now we have several illustrations in recent history. Lebanon followed by Grenada. Uh, Iran a hostage transfer followed by the Persian Gulf. Well now, you and I are students of people. It's pretty obvious to me that the president felt embarrassed about Lebanon, so Grenada was an answer. The president was embarrassed about the Iran hostage situation, so uh, the flagging of the ships in the Persian Gulf was an answer. Now those are personal things. That's not national, that's personal with him. We were not affronted, our country was not affronted when the president traded hostages for uh, we weapons or tried to do that. That was a mistake he made. It was not a mistake the people of this country made. And, and for him to vest upon ourselves a, a situation where we could be brought into a war unnecessarily, to make him feel better about himself. I'd like for him to feel better about himself, but I, but I don't think it's our responsibility to have to shed blood for it and to have to be in a position of going to war for it. And that's what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make to you here today is, don't forget, this revolution still continues. The American Revolution is a revolution in which the people control their government. The people don't want unnecessary wars. They don't want this demonstration of, of great power and thrusting things around over the surface of the earth for the purpose of making ourselves as a nation look grand or noble. They want, in fact, to have as much peace as they can in the world. They want freedom in the world. They want to demonstrate we can have a free country in this country. But this gradual movement toward the, uh, uh, the remonarchizing of our country is something we certainly should watch with great care and try to prevent. So I would say to you that the, the War Powers Act uh, Constitutional or not constitutional, it was bad. I voted against it. I'd have voted against it, not because of constitutional ground, because I thought that the, that that provision, the War Powers Act, gave power to the president he should not have. It allowed the president to have a 60-day war at his own request. Why in the world would you want to do that? No reason at all to do that. We ought to keep out as many wars as we can keep out of. We'll be safer in the long run if we do it. And so I'm saying to you in conclusion, and I think that this is a challenging subject to think about, but we ought to think about it in more simplistic terms. We ought not to think about it just from a standpoint of who has the power between the executive branch and the legislative branch and the judicial branch. We'll all be gone another decade. Nobody will even remember, not even the great man, Mr. Brzezinski, I heard here earlier. He's a great guy, he'll go down in history, but, but at the same time, not many people are going to remember him 20 years from now. And not going to remember me at all one year after I get out of Congress. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's not a thing we're doing for ourselves. It's a thing we're doing for humanity. It's a thing we're doing for our country. It's a thing we're doing for future generations. And that should be to see to it the people themselves control their government and to see to it that the people are not put in unnecessary wars. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Professor Miller. Yep. 
Well, I have uh, five simple points uh, that I think might help clarify uh, the debate somewhat on this subject, even if they don't command universal acceptance. Uh, they go from the self-evidently true to the plainly debatable. And I'd like you to think uh, how long you stay on this train of thought uh, before you get off. And I hope maybe some of you will stay on uh, until uh, the last stop. First proposition is that it's essential to the national interest and implicit in the Constitution that the nation be able to engage in military operations without a formal declaration of war. And I think that would gain assent from virtually everyone. The reasons are rather clear. First of all, declaration of war takes time. And as Dr. Brzezinski uh, has eloquently and poignantly shown, uh, we just don't have the time in uh, modern uh, warfare. Uh, while the speed of congressional action may have increased perhaps arithmetically, the speed of military action has increased uh, geometrically. Uh, second, even if there's time to declare war, there are many circumstances in which we wouldn't want to do it. A uh, declaration of war is a major diplomatic step with serious international repercussions. It heightens conflict, lays down a challenge to the other side, makes uh, compromise more difficult, complicates relations with allies, and may even benefit the enemy in some cases if uh, by dignifying the behavior uh, which we're opposing. And obviously, constitutional history, as Brad has pointed out, clearly demonstrates that there have been over 200 instances in the past uh, two centuries in which we did engage in international hostilities without a formal declaration of war. So that proposition, I think, is pretty clear and should gain nearly universal acceptance. Now, the second stop on this train ride is that the president is the official who oversees and supervises war making. And again, I think few people would disagree with that. Uh, it's obvious that Congress can't do that job. They tried during the Revolutionary War. It was a disaster. Congress eventually passed the supervision task to committees of Congress. That didn't work. They then created committees of individuals outside of Congress. That didn't work. Finally, Congress uh, created uh, uh, executive agencies uh, to supervise the Revolutionary War, and that worked. Uh, Congress didn't want to give that power away, but it had to because uh, otherwise uh, the nation was uh, not going to win the war. So it was simply impractical for Congress to carry out uh, uh, military operations or to supervise those operations on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a textual basis for the President's war-making powers in the Commander-in-Chief Clause and the provision giving the executive power to a unitary president, and it's been the uniform practice uh, for 200 years. So I think that stop on the train ride is pretty uncontroversial as well. Now the third uh, stop is that the president has inherent authority, that is authority even in the absence of implementing or authorizing legislation, to commit troops in a hostility short of war. I think this probably will gain assent from most people, although it might be opposed by some of the more vigorous advocates of congressional authority. What's the reason for it? Well, uh, I think it follows in a sense from the first two propositions that the nation can engage in hostility sort of war and that the president has to be the one to carry them out. Also, the uh, president's inherent authority to do this follows uh, from the fact that only the president can act with a dispatch, the speed necessary in emergencies. Only the president can be uh, uh, counted on to maintain secrecy where that's necessary, although I agree that Congress has a pretty good, rec pretty good record in maintaining uh, secrecy for national uh, security secrets. And finally, uh, if Congress were to act uh, to authorize this kind of uh, action, uh, well then, that's not much different than a declaration of war, so you don't get much benefit from requiring congressional action to authorize actions short of war. Well, if you go along this far, uh, what about the next one? And the next stop, which is Proposition 4, is that Congress may limit or stop particular commitments of troops by the president, uh, which are short of a declaration of war. And Congress can do this by legislation. So if the president commits troops, let's say, to hostile action in Central America, Congress could force the removal of those troops by legislation. Congress could accomplish the same thing by uh, legislation in the budget area, say, prohibiting the expenditure of federal funds for the conduct of military operations in Central America. And I think that power carries with it a right of Congress to be informed about what the president is doing. The president, I think, can be legitimately requested to tell Congress in advance where possible what his plans are, and if not possible in advance, at least within a reasonable time. 
The degree to which uh, the president provides information to Congress probably should depend on the degree to which Congress is able to, to give assurances that there won't be leaks or other uh, damaging use of the information. So uh, I think this proposition that Congress can stop or limit the president's actions by legislation, first of all, is textually based in the Constitution, as Bill Van Alstyne points out. Uh, secondly, it's supported by history. Presidents have gone along, in general, when Congress has, by legislation, tried to stop uh, presidential actions. And it seems reasonable in terms of the system of separated powers in the Constitution. So that's stop number four. And if you're still on, consider whether you'll follow me to the last stop in the train ride, which is Proposition 5. Congress may not unreasonably restrict the president's inherent power to commit troops short of war by general legislation that's not directed at particular controversies. So what I'm saying is Congress can uh, uh, force the president to get out of a particular situation by legislation, but cannot, uh, by general legislation not directed at a particular set of circumstances, unreasonably limit the president's inherent authority that most people would accept. Why do I believe that? Well, I think it's a reasonable middle ground between the powers of President and Congress. Advocates of legislative power might say that Congress, excuse me, advocates of executive power might say that Congress just can't prohibit the President from engaging in hostilities, even by subsequent legislation, because the President has the inherent power to conduct the operations and can't, Congress can't stop him. That seems too extreme on behalf of the executive. On the other hand, advocates of extreme congressional authority might say that uh, Congress has the power to prevent the President ever from engaging in hostilities short of a declaration of war, simply by passing a statute that says the President can't do it unless Congress has declared war. I think that goes too far in the direction of congressional authority. The reasonable middle ground is to say the President can commit troops short of war, Congress can reverse or modify by legislation directed to that particular controversy, but Congress can, in general terms, unreasonably limit the President's power to, uh, to engage in this kind of activity. I think that position is not ruled out by the constitutional text. It's a sensible approach to balancing the interests of the president and the Congress, and it's a workable system that might prove feasible in practice. Well, with those in mind, I want to say very briefly, uh, maybe one or two words about the War Powers Resolution, which is the statute that dominates debate in the area. Uh, first of all, in many ways, it, it is a commendable piece of legislation in that it seeks to provide a means of resolving the tension between President and Congress, and I think makes a good faith effort to give both President and Congress a role. It encourages cooperation and consultation, and as Dr. Brzezinski said, and I agree with him, that is all to the good, to the extent you have cooperation and consultation between President and the Congress. But I think the War Powers Resolution is flawed in a number of respects. First, it unduly limits the President's inherent power to conduct military operations short of war in the provision that requires the President to cut it out within 60, if Congress hasn't approved it within 60 days. Uh, this places the burden of legislative inertia on the President and the President's program. It severely limits the President's ability to carry out this kind of action, which I believe is part of the President's inherent authority under the Constitution. This kind of provision fails the fifth proposition. That is, it's a provision that is limits the President's power very severely, and it's not directed to any particular controversy. Second problem with the War Powers Resolution is the uh, maybe somewhat technical problem, but nevertheless important one, that uh, Congress can veto the President's actions even before 60 days are up by a concurrent resolution, a resolution that doesn't require the President's signature. Problem with that is that it cuts the President completely out of the process of debate and deliberation about what should be done, uh, and in a technical sense, is probably unconstitutional under the Supreme Court's uh, opinion in the Chadha case. Well, could the War Powers Resolution be fixed to go along with the five propositions that I, I said before? I think rather easily. You could keep the, all the requirements of consultation and uh, uh, information that the President inform and consult with Congress. Uh, provided that's interpreted in a, in a reasonable way so as not to unduly burden the uh, president. Uh, Brad mentioned some of the ways in which that could be problematic, but I think it could be interpreted in a reasonable way. But 
Instead of having the requirement of, of leaving after 60 days if Congress hasn't approved, and instead of the requirement that Congress may veto by concurrent resolution, simply allow Congress to veto, amend, or modify the President's action, in specific cases, by joint resolution, which is a resolution that requires the President's signature or passage over the President's veto. This brings the President into the process and I think better achieves the balance of power that is desirable under the Constitution. And Congress could certainly adopt provisions either by internal rule or by statute expediting consideration of a joint resolution of modification or disapproval. To my mind, that would be a useful modification to the War Powers Act that would be more consistent with uh, the constitutional system of checks and balances and separation of powers, which is one of the most remarkable features of our remarkable Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's now have a, a little bit of time for a speaker rebuttal. I'll ask uh, each speaker to uh, try to hold the rebuttal to around three minutes, if possible, to leave some time for question and answers. Uh, Brad, you want to start? Well, I don't. I won't. Uh, won't take uh, three minutes. Um, I think that the the only points to be made. Uh, my sense is that the discussions about the War Powers Act uh, that we've heard uh, were illuminating and thoughtful. I think that there's always a problem when lawyers begin to dive into the Constitution and begin to talk about uh, legislative interpretation with uh, different phrases here and there, that there's, there's that which is emphasized and then there's that which is not referred to. And the problem is that to sort out the constitutional questions, one has to look at a whole range of, uh, of provisions and, uh, and a lot of language. Uh, I think that uh, the analysis that uh, suggested that you could have uh, some kind of legislation that Congress would uh, be able to craft in this area, provided that it, uh, it flowed from a proper legislative power. And in that area, I think probably that's the appropriations power of Congress. Uh, and provided that it was legislation that called upon the both houses to act and the president to be part of the process, uh, at least sets the model for the way in which some kind of legislation in this area would have to be structured. Um, and I think that it is the case that, that, uh, that the President, I mean, that the Congress could devise legislation that would place limitations on actions that the President can do under, as Commander in Chief, uh, if it's done under that proper authority. Uh, my sense is that we certainly have a lot of questions that need to be answered with regard to the War Powers Resolution that's presently on the books uh, in view of recent decisions by Congress, the Chata decision was mentioned, I mean by the courts, and in view of the fact that it is a piece of legislation that by legislative inertia undoes or seeks to undo uh, certain activities that are clearly within the President's prerogative under uh, the executive power, and those two features of it, uh, it seems to me, need to be corrected in order for legislation of this, this kind to take place. Um, but, but I think that we, we have heard the relevant considerations to touch upon in, in trying to fashion uh, what's done. My, my strong sense is that uh, uh, the, the emphasis on seeking political solutions to, to the kinds of problems that are necessarily introduced whenever we get into the foreign relations field on a more bipartisan basis are better calculated to lead us to the right place in this area than seeking to come up with something that is going to be resolvable through through uh, specific legislation that is interpreted one way or the other. There's a fundamental problem that we, we never address in this area that is at the threshold uh, on any case, on, on any matters that, that deal in the foreign relations field and this tussle of executive and legislative power. And that is how you get the matter to the court uh, for purposes of 
of even having the court entertain on a, uh, the question from a jurisdictional standpoint. And I think that the questions that are presented with regard to the whole issue of who it is that can bring it to court and whether it's a case that is one of a nature that the courts jurisdictionally can entertain are probably uh, the more difficult questions than any of the ones we've been talking about and lead you to a point where uh, the proper resolution of, of these kinds of tussles between the two branches are more likely to be struck, uh, not in terms of how lawyers divine or define uh, the constitutional language, but in the political arena where you come to some accommodation on a more bipartisan basis with the two branches working together. Professor Van Alstyne. Well, there were really three, three points raised by two of my colleagues to which I wanted to address myself briefly. Two points by Mr. Miller and finally Congressman Bennett. Mr. Miller suggests that the President may be able to act to a certain extent without affirmative authorization by Congress. That is, they act in the sense that we've been discussing, deploying armed force to various tense environments around the world with no particular statutory authorization. I agree with that. That may very well be true. Those of you who can even remember a basic course in constitutional law may very well remember that the, perhaps the most famous dictum ever expressed in this area was that by Robert Jackson in the Steele seizure case, where he drew three divisions. That is, where the president acts on his own authority and affirmatively backed by an act of Congress, where he acts on his own authority and Congress has said nothing, neither to confirm nor disavow what the president elects to do. And last and least, which was the president's uh, weakest point in the Youngstown case, he lost. They had to return the mill. The president acts on his authority minus everything Congress possesses and has exercised affirmatively against what the president presumes to do. Now, the case I've been putting to you is the last case. That is the case where Congress addresses its attention affirmatively to the extent to which it does and does not wish the armed forces used as an instrument of foreign policy. And it so expresses itself. So my analysis with you in general runs along that line, and I think it stands on a very strong footing. Indeed, I don't know of any case, scholar, or plausible argument to suggest that the president merely as, quote, executive or nation's first minister or commander in chief may deploy armed forces in the teeth of an, an act of Congress which either doesn't provide any armed forces or provides them only for such use as may arise in the Western Hemisphere alone. The president is commander in chief with regard to such armed forces as Congress provides on such terms as it deems appropriate. Now, the other point Professor Miller made is an excellent one, but I want to separate it. He closed, it, it, as I am quoting him, although he, he said it, I think, uh, from script a little bit more lucidly originally. He says, Congress cannot unreasonably limit the president to engage in this kind of activity. Now, I want to separate that from the discussion I've been holding with you under the War Powers Act. Professor Miller is touching on another area where I think he's quite right and travels back to the Declaration of War Clause. If the country is engaged in hostilities, if indeed Congress has authorized our continuation in those hostilities at whatever magnitude or scale Congress has determined to be appropriate, I do not doubt that it is correct as a matter of understanding the War Clause and the Commander-in-Chief Clause that within the authorized field of hostilities as confirmed by appropriate act of Congress, the president as commander in chief now is chief tactician. That is to say, the combination of clauses disallows Congress from meddling in the particulars or minutia of tactics in the combat zone. Am I quite clear? That is very clear. Indeed, the original material in separating the executive function as commander in chief makes clear that the shift in nomenclature between, quote, declare, i.e., determine the appropriate circumstances according to which we shall embark on war, declare war, and, quote, make war, the original locution, was changed in the draft. So to make clear that Congress could not presume to gainsay the commander in chief's tactics within the battlefield, that would shift over from a separation of powers to an officious intermeddling. So I quite concur that to the extent that Congress may have affirmatively authorized the positive engagement of American armed forces in an environment of belligerency, it may then not uh, add in 
such tactical restrictions as more or less to uh, foreclose a plausibly and beneficial outcome. But as to whether they shall be committed, and indeed as to what must be done after a certain time of, uh, elapses, it seems to me, is clearly all within the propositions I previously shared with you. I respect his suggestion for revising the War Powers Act, but you must recognize that it would then be substantively a totally different act, and a very weak one indeed. For to the extent then that Congress must act affirmatively to terminate the thing and submit it to the President's veto and reenact it over two thirds, effectively the War Powers Act will have accomplished nothing at all. The ambition of the act is to hedge on the circumstances in which armed forces are initially deployed into highly volatile uh, uh, communities, those in which hostilities are either already underway or where the circumstances make self-evident, here I virtually close, quote the act, that, they, that those hostilities are eminent. It was therefore an effort to try to discourage the sense of adventurism. And indeed, you will find original conversations in the original debates, allocating the powers between Congress and the President precisely for this objective. The example was given of the English king who was forever getting the realm involved in foreign escapades, after the fait accompli of which, of course, Parliament would have no choice but to try to defend the realm from the terrible consequences of the involvement that the king had gotten in them, them into. The War Powers Act, in my opinion, is a good faith effort to mitigate that consequence and can be made viable as on the basis I've tried to suggest. Finally, uh, Congressman Bennett's Observation about the act, if true, would surely bring me to suggest that the act is not only inappropriate, but itself, quote, unconstitutional. That is to say, he shared with you his sense of alarm that this act creates in the president a blank check to make war at his discretion anywhere for 60 days. I do not read the act that way. Indeed, I read a certain section of it that this act shall not be interpreted as enlarging the powers of the president that he does not otherwise have. The language is careful and in my opinion meant only to say that, the, that, that nothing in this act means that Congress is in advance saying that not only may the president try to protect navigation and free commerce by deploying ships to protect that commerce, but may go to war and conduct it to the extent of his delight for a free period of 60 days. There is no such suggestion to the extent that American vessels might come under attack in that environment. I take it the President has, of course, an exigent emergency war making power to protect them from attack, to report to Congress and ask authority, if necessary, to enlarge the field of hostility. They say to take aggressive action against the sources from which the raids proceeded. Nothing in the War Powers Act does that. I take it what the President would do is exactly what I would quote to you Thomas Jefferson did in a like environment, also oddly enough in the, in the same uh, part of the world. So in his report uh, to developments on American commerce in the Mediterranean, Jefferson said the following, I sent a small squadron of frigates into the Mediterranean with assurances that of our sincere desire to remain in peace, but with orders to protect our commerce. The measure was seasonable and salutary. The Bay had already declared war. His cruisers were out. Two had arrived at Gibraltar. Our commerce in the Mediterranean was blockaded. The arrival of our squadron dispelled the danger. One of the Tripolitan cruisers having fallen in with and engaged the small schooner, Enterprise, commanded by Lieutenant Sterrett, uh, uh, was taken. Unauthorized by the Constitution, Without the sanction of Congress to go beyond the line of defense, the vessel being disabled from committing further hostilities was liberated with its crew. The legislature will doubtless consider whether by authorizing measures of offense also, they will place our force on an equal footing with that of its adversaries. I communicate all material information on this subject that in the exercise of this important function confided by the Constitution to the legislature exclusively their judgment may form itself on a knowledge and consideration of every circumstance. Congressman Bennett. Well, my theory is that the president, not because of the Constitution, but because of the inherent necessities of government, would have a right to involve 
military forces in purely defensive action. Flagging the vessels in the Persian Gulf was an invitation to war. It was not defensive. It was uh, putting a chip on your shoulder and saying, well, if Iraq wants us to go to war with Iran, all we have to do is another, remember the main incident, and uh, make it look like it, Iran did it, and we get us in the war against Iran. We've already been through one thing like that in 1898. Uh, or it could be, for some fanatical reason, uh, of, of the Khomeini thinking he'd go to heaven quicker or something, that he might want to bring that upon himself. What's wrong about it, what was wrong about flagging the vessels, was the fact that uh, Congress had not decided we wanted to do a warlike thing over there. And I'd like to address one or two things briefly. Uh, one of them is a declaration of war. I don't know why we're so uh, un unwilling to go to the dictionary to look up what a declaration of war is. All it is is an announcement of combat. Those are synonyms. It doesn't mean we have to have a vellum document with blue ribbon and a gold seal. It doesn't mean we have to have a joint session of Congress. It means we debate in Congress whether or not we're going to be at war and we make preparations to uh, take care of the military that go into war. We call people up for war, all the various acts you can do toward uh, deciding you're going to have a war. It doesn't require a piece of paper saying we hereby declare war. Next point. People have referred earlier today to 199 instances of uh, where we've been in a warlike situation or a combat situation. Uh, some of times there were no rounds fired, but there are 199 instances have been uh, cited by the Congressional um, Research Agency or was service. And I looked through them and almost all of them are something like protecting the, the um, embassy or something like that. Many times not a single round was fired when military people were there. Well, so what? Nobody has ever said that the president shouldn't be allowed to protect United States interests that way. What I say, and what most people say that have been in combat, is we don't want to have any unnecessary wars. We want it to be arrived at by a judgment that that's the only thing that we can properly do. And that is given to the Congress of the United States, it's not given to the president, which leads me to another point. A lot of discussion here about the commander in chief. Well, I'm a, a, a amateur historian. I've written and published five books, one of them on the American Revolution. And it has a lot to do with uh, uh, this very issue. Why the president was uh, uh, under the Constitution declared to be commander in chief? Well, the real reason was because George Washington during the revolution didn't have control of the militia. And neither did any of his continental superior generals have uh, control of the militia. Down in the state of Florida, General Howe, um, Robert Howe brought uh, a couple of thousand uh, continentals down there in my hometown of Jacksonville. And um, uh, from Georgia, the commander in chief of the Georgia forces, their militia, a couple of thousand more up there on the St. Mary's River. And they couldn't get together. They wouldn't even share grits together. They wouldn't do anything together. And so they finally had to go back. They chickened out. Why? There just wasn't any, any uh, 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 authority over it. So when the Constitutional Convention got together, they said, that can't happen again. The, the president or somebody in this country has got to have control over it. And so they made the commander in chief in two instances in the Constitution in charge of the militia. So the militia couldn't back out. So the federal government could control the militia from a central authority. Now that's where the commander in chief comes about. After all, if, even if it weren't that, again, get out Webster's dictionary, get the dictionary, read commander in chief. I doubt if you'll ever find in, the, in any dictionary of any country, even uh, uh, South American Republic, that a commander in chief decides when you go to war. Commander in chief merely executes the military power after the government has decided to go to war. We don't have a banana republic in this country. The commander in chief did not give the, pre the president the ability to, as, command as the commanding general, you might call him, of all the military forces, to decide whether you go into war. There's no vestige of such power in history, in the dictionary, or anywhere else. So that's been made too much of. I think I should conclude my remarks by uh, just referring again to who apparently is your uh, patron saint here, and I agree with you, he should be. I visited his great home recently. It was just opened up in, in uh, central Virginia, Montpelier. I hope you all go to that. It's a lovely place to see that great 
majestic mansion that that little tiny man of great intellectual spirit said, the Constitution supposes what the history of government demonstrates, that the executive is the branch of power most interested in wars and most prone to it. It has accordingly, with studied care, vested this question in the legislature. End of quotation. Thank you, Congressman. Jeff Miller. Uh, well, I am deeply comforted by the fact that uh, Professor Van Alstyne seems to agree with some of the things I've said. I've uh, learned very much from him over the years, and I will continue to do so, I'm sure. He agrees that uh, the president has inherent authority to commit troops uh, in the absence of war, number one. He also agrees that Congress may not constitutionally interfere with the president's day-to-day uh, uh, operations and tactical conduct of military operations. So I think there's an interesting point of, of, of congruence between our views and I think between the views generally of those who are in favor of presidential authority and those who favor congressional authority in this area. I do think that he and I disagree on, on two points and the points are ones of emphasis and, agree, and degree. First, uh, he says that the president has inherent authority, but he apparently agrees that that authority exists only if Congress hasn't said no. If Congress says no, you can't do it to the president, then I think Professor Van Alstyne would say the president cannot uh, continue the operations. Well, um, I suppose there's some merit to that to the degree to which uh, I, I stated earlier, but not in the sense that Congress can say no in advance of the president's uh, committing troops. And I think uh, Professor Van Alstyne errs by essentially reading this power out of the Constitution if the Congress says no. He says, for example, or it's useful to remember that Justice Jackson's opinion in the steel seizure case did not say that if Congress says no, the president has no power to act. The opinion said, if the Congress says no, the president's power to act is at a minimum, but not that he has no power to act. So uh, even if one agrees with the, that point of view, the Jackson point of view, which is not the law of the land, but was in a, uh, I guess, a concurring opinion, uh, it doesn't follow that the president is completely divested of inherent authority if Congress says no. Now, Professor Van Alstyne says, for example, Congress could constitutionally tell the president, you can commit troops, but only in the Western Hemisphere. You can't commit troops anywhere else. I don't agree with that. I mean, how far will it go? Could Congress uh, constitutionally tell the president, I'm sorry, you can't commit troops anywhere. You just can't commit troops unless we have a formal declaration of war. Would you go along with that? That seems to be too extreme. And if that's the case, then where do you stop? I think the president has got to have some inherent authority to commit the troops even if Congress is attempted by general legislation to prevent the president uh, from doing it. Um, and so uh, the second point and final point I want to make on that is that uh, Professor Van Alstyne agrees that the uh, Congress cannot pre interfere unreasonably with the conduct of day-to-day -day military operations by the president. But while acknowledging that there's this limit on congressional authority, he gives it an extremely niggardly interpretation, in my opinion. I don't think that day-to-day -day operations of military uh, uh, affairs can be uh, cabin so neatly into that simple category. They can't be conducted, for example, without some overall strategy. So the president has to be involved in the overall strategy as well as the implementation. And they need to uh, be conducted with a view towards all kinds of subtle inferences about United States interests and military needs. So the president's inherent authority, I think, can't be limited to the minutia of day-to-day -day military operations. Instead, the authority to supervise and conduct operations supports the president's power to commit troops short of war, and the lack of congressional power unreasonably to interfere with the president's action by that kind of general legislation. So to, just to repeat one very quickly, the president can commit troops short of war or otherwise engage in military operations without a declaration of war. Congress can veto or modify the president's actions by suitable legislation enacted under a bona fide claim of head of congressional authority. Brad mentioned the spending power, and I agree with that. And finally, that Congress may not, by general framework legislation, unreasonably interfere with the president's power to engage in that kind of behavior, although Congress can uh, veto or modify specific cases of presidential action. Thanks.
We have about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, given the short period of time, I suggest we go directly to questions from the audience. Uh, I guess we already have a line right here. If, uh, if, you, would, uh, take, if you would take care to direct uh, your question to a particular panel member, I think that would expedite matters. Thank you. Ted Carpenter from the Cato Institute. I have a question primarily for Mr. Reynolds, but other members of the panel might wish to comment as well. In a position paper issued by the State Department in January of 1951, uh, at a time when Congress was attempting to uh, cut off funds for the Korean military operation and also to prohibit President Truman from unilaterally sending additional troops to Western Europe, the State Department indicated that the appropriations power of Congress could not be constitutionally used to deprive the President of his constitutional authority as Commander-in-Chief of the military. A question I have for Mr. Reynolds is, in your view, constitutionally, may the Congress use the appropriations power, for example, to cut off funds for a presidential military operation that it opposes? And if not, what can Congress do lawfully to terminate such an operation? Well, since Congress does actually declare war by making an appropriation knowingly that it's going to be used in combat, I would say that Congress would have the authority to stop the appropriation. I don't, uh, I have not briefed it. I'm an erstwhile lawyer myself, but I have not briefed that question, but I suspect that good authority could be found for that. Brad, would you care to comment? I like I think that it, it is under the uh, spending power that Congress has the authority to act, and uh, my sense is that just as a question of constitutional power authority to take such action, that uh, I would come down on the side of saying that Congress could pass such legislation, and uh, that it would probably be it would probably be a constitutional act by Congress, uh, whether it's wise or prudential is a whole other set of questions, but I think that probably there is, there is authority under the spending power for Congress to, to do what you described. Yes, sir. My name is John Wallstetter. I'm with Contel Corporation. As an attorney, I direct this question in the first instance to Professor Van Alstyne and anyone else who wishes to comment, of course, may. I, my question is on the extent of the president's inherent authority. Uh, and the example I would refer to is Franklin Roosevelt. In May of 1941, the British lost track of the German battleship Bismarck. And under orders uh, from, the, uh, from the president, the Navy uh, was searching for the Bismarck. And in fact, an American plane found the Bismarck, radioed its position to the British, who then uh, picked up the chase. We were, of course, at that time, not only not at war, but under the provisions of the Neutrality Act. In your judgment, does the pre uh, president have any authority in circumstances like that to act under inherent power? And would you extend it, if so, to any other types of situations? I appreciate the question. Uh, <clears throat> I will not avoid it, th th but I must necessarily disclaim enough familiarity with the actual episode to want to be bound to an answer which is only hypothetically correct. That is to say, if there were in place a neutrality act, and if, as I understand, the president's action, both according to that statute and by international law standards, is inconsistent with it, I don't doubt at all that he acted lawlessly. He acted improperly. Um, he, he, he cannot claim an inherent authority to ignore a neutrality act on the part of Congress. To my, to my way of thinking, that's, a, that's an absurd proposition. And while I have the floor on that, I, again, I want to be clear about what the scope of my concession about inherent power in the executive to act is still always qualified by the primary proposition I tried to share somewhat convincingly with you in my opening remarks. And that is that it is still up to Congress to decide in the first instance the extent to which the armed forces of the United States shall be used as an instrument of national policy or of foreign policy. Um, and to the extent that they provide that the armed forces shall not be used in particular ways, I regard that as quite conclusive. The source of the authority in Congress so to control the matter exclusively is their own exclusive and plenary authority to raise and provide for and maintain and provide for the government and regulation of the Army and Navy. It is just as simple as that. It is not enmeshed with these other problems. My answer to your question, though, is yes, technically, I believe that the President, if the circumstances were exactly as you described, 
violated a valid act of Congress. Yes. Or, or, no. or similar restriction of, of the no, use of the I, army at all, and I just wanted absolutely. to... Absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I wish so much that I could have chat with Professor Miller ahead of time rather than on camera this way, so we might sort out some, some uh, excellent differences. Then we wouldn't no, have I start from the basic... Pro if, look, Congress may furnish no army and navy at all. They may provide one that consists of a battalion of people carrying slingshots. The president may feel tremendously frustrated. Too bad. He commands nothing other than a battalion of slingshot. Too bad. Congress may also authorize as part of the armed force a nuclear fleet, indeed nuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs. In my view, even consistent with my earlier proposition that during times of declared war, Congress's power to declare war of a qualified kind means Congress could positively forbid the president from using atomic weaponry in a given theater of engagement. For in my view, that degree of restraint over the program, at least, is generic enough that Congress could have its way even with regard to that circumstance and even in times of a declared qualified war according to the congressional prescription. That say to authorize the use under executive authority of belligerent force of a sustained nature in a hostile theater, exclusive, however, of any atomic weaponry. In my view, the President's Commander-in-Chief would be bound by that admonition even under the otherwise explicit authorization by the Congress of the United States, it will speak of nothing to talk about his inherent power to use atomic bombs under those circumstances. Uh, Paul Kaminar from the Washington Legal Foundation. I have a uh, comment and a question about, uh, first of all, a key provision of the War Powers Act about which I think there's some confusion or misconception. Uh, I think, Professor Van Alstein, you referred to the provision that requires after 60 days that there be a, quote, withdrawal, end quote, of troops in the area. I'm not so sure that's the language of the, of the statute. I think Brad Reynolds was closer to the mark where he talked about the termination of, of the troops. Uh, there's a, that's a significant difference in the sense that the president is not required to with, physically withdraw the troops from that zone of hostilities or imminent hostilities, but merely to terminate the use. Now, and, and Brad, I, I fault you on the, uh, where you say that there's a termination of any use. Again, the statute does not say terminate any use of those troops after 60 days, but terminate the use for which the troops were put there in the first place. They may have many uses in that area. They could guard embassies, they could patrol boats, they could uh, escort, they could sweep mines. I'm suggesting that perhaps the president can still comply with the War Powers Act and have flexibility by terminating a particular use after 60 days and perhaps do some other use for a while and restart the 60-day clock again. Uh, that may be a te uh, one technical way to, to get around the act, but we can blame that on sloppy draftsmanship by the, by the Congress. The, the question I really have is though, not deals with the related power to the war power that no one I think has ever addressed uh, that I've read about even is the Congress's power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, there's a little history on that and, and I guess it's been used on occasion to go after international outlaws and pirates, the Barbary pirates and so forth and maybe there may be a provision there that can we apply that in modern times. In other words, could Congress grant, grant a letter of mark and reprisal against an international terrorist uh, or outlaw like Muammar Gaddafi and make him a quote unquote a marked man and let somebody like H. Ross Perot get the bounty uh, on that. <laughs> um, I'll pick up on that just because it allows one to say something additionally useful. I like that clause, the mark and reprisal clause. I like it partly because it's among a half dozen wonderfully obscure clauses in an antiquarian constitution which we appropriately celebrate partly on account of its unique 200, uh, ancient, 200 year oldness, the oldest in the world. But there is a lot more serious point. Yes, that has rarely been used. And that was put in there because it was uh, thought otherwise unclear as to whether or not such tiny authorized acts of even private piratism might be authorized. They'd say whether or not declarations of war wouldn't allow one to go after it in such a retail fashion. The discussion is very interesting. And so this was put in from an abundance of precaution that indeed the, the Congress could authorize private parties to seek revenge or to seek retaliation, as it were, under discrete circumstances, and they would be acting under the authority of Congress. You're quite right. The larger point, 
to come back to reality. That's also part of a larger discussion. Congress may declare little wars. They say it may authorize limited circumstances of engagement under the executive power. It is not a, an all or nothing kind of thing. Even at the bottom end of that, this added clause was then tucked in from an uncertainty whether or not the understanding that of course you may authorize a limited engagement confined to a given geography, confined to a certain genus of weapon and so on, a certain theater of action only. This one was added from an abundance of precaution that wouldn't it be also useful to make clear Congress could authorize even these kind of retail devices, the authorization of private parties, some of whom might be seeking private revenge against foreign powers against whom nonetheless the United States did not want to deal nation to nation. But it's just an interesting retailing of the refinement on the total command over the war power, the graduation of it, right down to the detail of private action. Next question. I'm Dennis Teddy from uh, Congressman Jim Corder's office, and this question is for Mr. Reynolds. Um, you've given maybe a pretty, a pretty convincing case, I think, for the, for the breadth of executive uh, power over foreign policy. Uh, my question is, I'm troubled by the fact that the Oval Office doesn't seem to have heard, heard the case that you just made. Uh, the question really is why it is that President Reagan himself doesn't seem to be willing to assert the leadership that you're saying is constitutionally the president's in foreign policy. I'll give you two examples if you like. One is the Poland Amendment, which you yourself mentioned. And it seems if the, that if the president had had scruples about the Boland Amendment, it would have been wise in 1984 to have said so. Um, as far as I know, nothing was said, and, and instead uh, a way was found, methods were found for getting around the Boland Amendment instead of, uh, in, instead of confronting Congress over it. And the other example maybe is even more egregious, and that is that after the Iran-Contra hearings were over, um, it wasn't a week after those hearings were over when it was pretty clear to many people, I think, that the hearings were not even successful in terms of Congress's effort to extend its involvement in foreign policy, that the president simply collapsed to uh, Congress's demands uh, for uh, a new policy with regard to the Contras. And what I'm saying is that uh, you've got it, you cite many historical examples to try to show uh, the executive's control over foreign policy. It seems to me that President Reagan is pretty much obligated to continue uh, that history, and that if he doesn't do it, he's really weakening the case for executive control over foreign policy. Well, let me let me say uh, first on the Bolton Amendment. I think that the the example that example that you point out points up one of the one of the major difficulties that uh, that exists in this whole area. Uh, the Boland Amendment is tacked on to uh, uh, an authorization uh, legislation that uh, puts the president in the position where he doesn't have the ability or the flexibility to uh, to respond to that kind of legislation on its own terms because there are so many other pressures that uh, exist that require that uh, there be approval of the overall piece of legislation uh, in order to prevent the government as a whole from uh, grinding to a to a very dramatic halt. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things that I think uh, uh, we've seen uh, to a fault uh, Congress uh, do in, uh, in recent years uh, with uh, a whole lot of legislation, uh, basically tie the president's hands in terms of being able to respond as he would want and should with regard to pieces of legislation that, uh, that don't deserve uh, the signature of the president. Um, but he cannot take that action because they necessarily have to go through along with the overriding uh, legislation that uh, is directed at something far more dramatic and the political pressures and the political cal calculus of the time uh, requires that there be passage. Uh, and the Bolin Amendment is a classic example of as I, I can think of in, in that regard. Um, on, the, on the other question, uh, one of the things that I would caution against is simply that uh, in the arena that, uh, that we deal in with foreign uh, affairs, it is particularly easy for those on the outside to Monday morning quarterback uh, the calls that are made of, by those who are on the inside. And it is always the case, I have learned, uh, sometimes the hard way, that the information that those people on the outside think they have is about one-tenth of what the total picture is uh, that's confronting the president at any particular time on any issue. Uh, 
Uh, there are a whole host of reasons why decisions are made at one time or another, uh, why they're deferred, why their actions taken, uh, etc. Uh, I, I can't and, uh, and wouldn't want to, uh, in this kind of a setting, uh, speak particularly to all the different pieces of the calculus that go into uh, the President's decisions with regard to uh, uh, the Nicaraguan situation or any other situation, but I would say that what we read about in the press by those who write with seeming uh, knowledge that is, is far more expansive than, uh, than anything that, uh, that is at all uh, accurate, and uh, what all of us, when we talk about these issues, uh, plug in as our frame of reference is really uh, very much uh, but a small percentage of the whole calculus. And it's very easy to second guess a lot of times uh, decisions that are made based on what our particular piece of knowledge is uh, and forget the fact that there is an awful lot of other information brought to bear on these questions, uh, political, policy-wise, et cetera, uh, that probably if we were all privy to them would help to explain in better terms and satisfy a lot of people as to why that decision was made at that particular time. I'm advised that we have uh, a few more minutes for questions. Uh, let's take a, a, at least two more. Thank you. I'm Tom Clark from the Columbia Law School uh, Federalist Chapter. First, I'd just like to probe Professor Van Elsen just a little bit on uh, the jump from the conclusion that since under the spending power, Congress would really have no obligation to provide for an army and a navy at all or to expend money from it, that you arrive at the conclusion that uh, the Commander-in-Chief Clause doesn't provide necessity uh, for Congress um, uh, not, not to withhold any kind of powers uh, or that it gives the President no residual power to order the spending uh, or the authority uh, to dispose troops once that has been made. It seems to me uh, that if the Commander-in-Chief Clause has any independent value, it wouldn't be too outlandish to analogize to, you know, constitutional precedents holding that although government may have no obligation to give some kind of right or, or, or relief or benefit, that once it does make that decision that, you know, equal protection or due process or some other positive component of the Constitution creates an obligation uh, not to restrict it in some unconstitutional way. So you may have a case where, um, you know, they don't have to spend anything, but once they spend it, the tactical or strategic deployment of those assets once made are within the core value of the Commander-in-Chief Clause. And then I guess secondly, and just more generally, and to this, if anyone on the panel would, would like to respond, um, is it necessarily a constitutionally foregone conclusion that uh, the spending power extends sort of indefinitely, temporally, even after expenditures have been made? For example, the ships in the Persian Gulf know to have oil on them now that were purchased a long time ago. Salaries have been paid, bullets have been bought, and so forth. Does the spending power necessarily carry all the way up? And if it does, I mean, money is spent when uh, troops are deployed in tactical troop movements. I mean, trains are run, you know, planes carry them. Presumably money is being outlaid in the process there. Does that mean that Congress can, in fact, go into the actual tactical deployment under the spending clause? And what limitations, if any, would exist? Could it not be that, in fact, other provisions of the Constitution suggest the opposite, such as the two-year limitations on expenditures that the framers might have intended that whatever oversight role Congress would have would naturally be met in that oversight, and that the President was given some power to carry on independently, but of course he couldn't prosecute a long war without popular consent because Congress Congress could cut him off after that time. And, you know, does that structural limitation of two years itself imply that outside of it, in other words, within the two-year limitation, Congress should have uh, not so much power to interfere with the president? Thank you. <laughs> I think I got lost a bit. I'll try to answer the fragment that I think I can recall. Although I'll start at the end. Actually, I won't do that. Unlike some of my colleagues, I do not attach much of power to, uh, uh, or appropriateness to the spending clause and want to suggest a correction in your own presentation. My presentation really isn't built on the spending clause at all. It's built on the separate power. You go back again, look at that outline, look at Article 1, Section 8. It starts out by saying Congress shall have power to levy taxes, then the spending clause follows. To, it, says, to, it says to levy taxes to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. It's a limitation on the functions for which taxes may be levied. Okay? Now, you provide for the common defense. 
by many ways. You may build bomb shelters, if you will. You may do lots of kinds of things. I was talking about a separate source of enumerated power in Congress, quite aside from this one. And that's why the main body of my argument is different from that of many of my colleagues and much of what I regard as the gratuitous ambiguity in much of this debate. There's a separate power to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, and then to make all laws necessary and proper to carry into execution the express powers of the president to the extent that Congress thinks it helpful. That's where I put the main body of my case. My case, therefore, in the first step is that however Congress may want to spend money otherwise to provide for the common defense, and there are a variety of things it may and does and always has done in that regard, it separately has this sole enumerated power to, to provide for armies and navies and to prescribe the uses, therefore, to be made of them. There's nothing inconsistent in that proposition with the different one that I was trying to share with you from the understanding that does arise under the Declaration of War Clause, linked with the President's power as Commander-in-Chief, in circumstances of a described and declared war by Congress. And that is the proposition that under those circumstances where Congress has affirmatively embraced the commitment to belligerent activities on a sustained basis overseas, then your proposition is sound at some level. Congress may not presume to dictate the minute strategy and tactics of the president's conduct of the authorized enterprise that has thus been authorized. There are more than one theme. There's more than one principle. There's more than one arrangement that is involved here. But to go upstream again to my stronger proposition, I do not doubt, with all respect, and I cannot find a suitable basis of opposition on the proposition, that if Congress does not wish to authorize the use of American armed forces outside the United States, While that would be a preposterous decision, in my view, I don't understand the policy wisdom of it. It is there so to dispose of the matter. It may then simply embarrass the president insofar as he might otherwise wish to use the armed forces, whether as an instrument of foreign policy or indeed to rescue American citizens from dire predicaments. It's simply that simple. As... uh Brad, do you have a short comment? Yeah, let me just say one. I, I would just say that I, because I think it's relevant to what, to, to what the uh, question addressed, uh, it, it is my sense that uh, the terms raise and support and provide and maintain uh, are somewhat different from deploy or commit. And I don't think that uh, uh, it's quite as uh, obvious as, as suggested that the necessary and proper clause uh, allows one to read into the uh, raise and support and provide and maintain language the the uh, the kind of extended activity that has been suggested here with regard to uh, the legislative branch's ability uh, to get involved in uh, in deployment and commitment of. Uh, of forces in the way that uh, that seems to be suggested by this new look at the uh, at the Constitution. Uh, I would also say, as to the other part, that the spending uh, clause, which I think does allow Congress to withhold funds uh, or to uh, uh, to expend funds in the, in this arena, uh, does not carry with it. Uh, any uh, expanded notion that you can use that in order for Congress to get in, get in and micromanage uh, uh, foreign affairs or military operations or the technical uh, uh, employment of tactical employment of those expenditures, so that uh, it is it is heaping an awful lot on the constitutional uh, uh, text and and context to begin to start talking about the more expansive sorts of activities that we seem to be suggesting the legislation can engage in uh, by reason of the, of the words that the uh, framers used. I am told that uh, our Secretary Weinberger is here. Uh, I must ask you uh, not to leave the room for those of you who are seated to remain seated for security reasons. Uh, we're asking people who are standing to be seated. Uh, On behalf of the panel, uh, we thank you, the Federalist Society, and James Madison.